Hey guys, how's it going? And welcome to the Rebel Pastor YouTube channel. Pastor Sky over here. Hope you guys are having an amazing and awesome week. Thank you so much for everyone out there who is supporting all the new subscribers and such. And like, you know, it's a big welcome to you guys. I think 49% of my subscribers, or not subscribers, but people who watch my podcast, 49% are actually not subscribed. So if this is your first time or if you like this content, go ahead, hit that subscribe button. I would very much appreciate it. And for all of you out there in the live chat room, click that like button. And also on top of it, you know, say a lot of stuff in that chat room. Uh, for me, I really, really enjoy that chat room too. So if you have anything that's um, anything that's going on in your heart, your mind, things you need prayer for, put that in the chat room. Uh, there will be people in there that will pray for you too. Why? And it's, and it's, not, it's not anyone that's working on this channel. It's kind of just what our community is like. We'll pray for you. We'll make sure that everything is going. Uh, we'll pray for you so that everything goes well in your life also. Um, this year, 2024. What are we trying to do, guys? We're trying to hit 10,000 subscribers. So this is something that I hope that uh, everyone can help out. And one way you can is not only just watching, not only just subscribing, hitting all notification bells, like notifications. Uh, it's not just about liking or commenting also, but I would say the big thing right now is go ahead and share this to as many people as possible. Today's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be more of a message towards those who are actually born in this faith. A little bit different, right? Because... Like myself, I am a third generation Christian, a third generation. Uh, my grandfather was the first generation. Then my parents were second generation. They immigrated to Canada. I was born in Canada, but I am also third generation Korean Christian. So uh, this is not one of those messages. I hope that it'll reach out and uh, really open up your hearts, especially those who have been here for a long time, especially those pastor, pastors, kids out there and stuff like that too. You know, one question that someone actually gave me was they're asking me because last week I did talk about the movies that I watched. Like the very first movie in the theater uh, was Raiders of the Lost Ark. I went to the theaters to watch it. And that's, I think it's like 1981. So that's a long, long time ago, right? Most of you weren't even born at that time. But it's really interesting because they're like, all right, so like what music do you listen to? And I would say because like the 80s was something that I didn't really listen to until like the later 80s. I was like, of course, Michael Jackson, Lionel Richie. Then it goes into like Bobby Brown. And then you'll have Boys to Men. You know, uh, you have all these other different, you know, uh, amazing artists that were from my generation. But I would say, like for me, I don't know why, but I was really, really into boy bands. Okay. And my favorite boy band of all time, some of you know, it is the Backstreet Boys. I know like all their songs, all the lyrics and stuff like that too. Uh, I really believe, right? And you could put this post this in there because I don't think most people know the Backstreet Boys. And there was a big battle between Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. And I would say, hands down, Backstreet Boys defeats NSYNC. In album sales and popularity, their songs, everything else, their musical singing, whatever it is, they're so much better than NSYNC. That's just my opinion, right? I'm sure it's a little bit different for you guys out there. And of course, Justin Timberlake was there on NSYNC. So all the girls were like, ah, Justin Timberlake, right? But for me, it was definitely Backstreet Boys. They're, they're probably the greatest, uh, for me, greatest boy band of all time. Better than NSYNC, better than New Kids on the Block, but they're like one of the originals, right? Uh, better than Westlife, better than One Direction, better than all those other different wannabe boy bands. Backstreet Boys was the boy band of all boy bands. I'm not sure what you think about this, causing some controversy right now, but that's just my opinion, all right? Uh, also, oh, I uh, don't want to forget, huge shout outs once again to SB, the Summy Boys, for making the intro for this, uh, for my videos now. Uh, they are uh, good friends of mine. I've known them for probably over 10 years now. Uh, they do make their own music, so I am thinking about putting some more of their stuff on my channel too because they're uh, they're just doing an amazing job. They are it's all faith based music. It's Christian music. It's rap and hip hop and stuff like that too. Very very positive. So uh, I hope that I, I can start posting them onto my um, uh, onto my channel and hopefully uh, it'll gain more traction too. But they're 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 amazing. They're awesome. They're young. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I'm hoping to be able to go visit them sometime this year too. All right. So, uh, yeah, let's get into, uh, first, a, a very interesting testimony that I wanted to give. All right. So 
last week I talked about that story of expectation. You know, two weeks ago was about Naaman and how our expectations can hinder us from, you know, meeting with God or seeing what God is doing in our life. And last week, what did I talk about? What was the story about last week? Oh, last week was about getting a car, you know, and I thought it would come from my parents. I thought it would come from me winning the lottery, but it came from my, it came from a friend instead, right? But this week, um, this one's a little bit more sadder. It's a bit more sadder because I did get conned, uh, conned, okay? So here's the story. So what happened was, I believe in 2005, uh, I was sent uh, to London, right? The UK. And I went there to pioneer a new church, to start a brand new church from scratch. Uh, I would be going everywhere to evangelize, meeting people on the streets, meeting them at parks, meeting them at libraries, all these are different places and such, right? And one of the things I really needed at that time was a laptop. Like I really, really needed a laptop. And I was just like, God, if I need to report, you know, to other churches of what's going on, I need a laptop so I can send news to them. I can, you know, send pictures and all those different. I was like, God, I really, really need a laptop. So here I am praying about this laptop. And every day when I was going to, you know, like uh, spread the gospel all over the streets, there was this one electronic store I would always stop by because they had all these laptops lined up for people to look at. And every day I would go into that store and check out laptops because I'm like, God, I need a laptop. And of course, you know, sometimes we see a laptop and there's something that's good enough for what I need. And it's, you know, it's cheap too. But, you know, you always like, oh, but look at that laptop. Oh, but look at that laptop. Oh, look at that. And you, you kind of get into this laptop that's like two, three thousand dollars You're like, oh, I really need this kind of thing, right? And every day I would go to there. Now, one day, when I came out of that shop, there was some guy who was leaning on the wall. And as I passed by, he says to me, you looking for a laptop? And for me, I was like, what? How did you know? And I was like, this must be from God. So I was like, I was like, yeah. And he's like, hey, I got a laptop for sale. Um, you know, and he started telling me his story like, man, you know, our, our, our family's running into some hard times and we really, you know, I really just sell this laptop. So he takes me around the corner into an alley. So you already know there's a bad sign, but because of my, you know, I'm so naive at that time thinking that this is God doing this for me. I follow him into the alley and he put, takes me into his car. So now I'm sitting inside his car. And he shows me a laptop and says to me, this is a laptop. It's like a brand new Sony laptop. He shows me the receipt and I was like, whoa. And he says to me, like this thing, I remember I was in London. He's like, it's 1,500 pounds. And I'm like, I just gotta let you know, um, I'm a minister and I don't have that kind of money. And he said to me, well, how, uh, you know, I'm really, I'm desperate. How about 1,200? And I was like, I saw, I just don't have that money. He's like 800. And the moment he said 800, it was so interesting because in my thoughts, I was like, whoa, this guy is really like really desperate. I wonder how low I can get it. Right. And he's like, come on, man, 800. That, you know, that's, that's, that's like half the price. I was like, I can't do. It. And then I started gaining confidence. Like I have the upper hand because this guy is desperate and he brings it down to 400. And I basically said to him, I was like, I just gotta let you know, I don't have that type of money. I, I just can't. And he says to me, what can you afford? And you know, this is a red flag, but because of my stupidity, I'm just like going, oh, I can pick my number. And I told him 200 pounds, which was like about the amount of money I had left in my bank account. And I was like, am I really going to get this laptop for 200 pounds? And I was like getting really excited. He's like, then you see him like, he's so down, like, oh, I can't do 200. He's like, all right. Okay. Yeah. You know, I really need this for my family. And he says, okay, I'll sell it to you for, for 200. So he's like, okay. He's like, and he said, I'll even give you a laptop bag. So he takes a laptop bag, puts the laptop in it. We go around the, we go around and I told him, I don't have that money on me. I go, I got to go to a bank machine. And he's like, all right. 
So I go to the bank machine and he brings a laptop with him and I take out 200 pounds. I give it to him. He gives me the laptop and he leaves and I leave. I am super excited. I am so happy. Like, whoa, I just got a laptop. Jehovah Jireh, God provides. So amazing. And I run to the Starbucks because I know Starbucks has free Wi-Fi. And I'm like going, I'm going to celebrate God. I'm going to buy the most expensive drink on the menu. What am I going to get? Caramel macchiato and make it a venti. And I was like so happy and excited. Got my drink, went downstairs. And I'm like, this is it. I sit down at the table. I open up the bag and I take out a phone book. I was like, what? Where's a laptop? And then I look at the bag and there's like two bricks on the bottom to give it weight. I was like, what the heck? I look, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just got conned. And I was like, no way. I ran back outside, going back to that alley. And of course they were gone. And I sat there just like, no way. I was completely devastated and broken. And I was like, I just gave him. the last bit of money that I had in my account and how am I going to live for the next month? And I was too ashamed to tell, you know, the, the, church, you know, the people there that were supporting me that I just got conned and I couldn't say anything. And uh, I kind of just lived off like scraps for the rest of the month. And I was sitting there so devastated, like, I am so sorry, God. Even the money that I spent, the 200 pounds that I gave, that was the money you gave me, and I squandered it like this. And I was repenting about this. The crazy thing that happened was the next month, I get a call from my parents. And my parents say to me, it's like, hey, uh, you know, is there anything you need? I was like, oh, I, I need a laptop, this, 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 and this. And my parents said, oh, yeah, we'll get you a laptop. We'll send it to you. And I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah, yeah, we'll get you a laptop. I was like, what? And they said, oh, we just sold our business for a premium. So what happened with my parents is they have this deli. And um, one thing that was happening during that time in the 2000s, in the 2000s, there were many people from Korea who were trying to move into the States. Right? They wanted to go to the States, but it was easier to move to Canada. And then for you to get your visa to Canada, you just need to buy a business. So this rich Korean guy comes to Vancouver, sees my mom's business and says, I'll buy it off you and I'll pay for more than it's worth. And not only will I do that, I'll hire you guys to run, these, to, to run that deli. So these, this rich Korean guy pays for this business more than it's worth. They have all this extra money and they bought me a laptop. And this is one thing that I realized at that moment is, is like, man, like the ex, isn't it so crazy? The different type of expectations we have, how God works in our life, like we really look for the miraculous things. Someone standing on the side asking me, do I need a laptop? Like they're reading my mind, giving me a 1500 pound laptop for only 200 pounds. Like this is what we kind of expect. But God does it in these reasonable and rational ways that we don't expect. And it ends up hurting us. That here I am, I don't even get those 200 pounds, right? I lose 200 pounds. And I'm so embarrassed. I'm suffering for the rest of the month when God has already planned getting me a laptop in a different way, which is way better. That my parents can sell their business. They get paid to work at the business. Like for me, I was like, man, God, you, it's like Isaiah chapter 55, verse eight and nine. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. You know, it's so different. But for some reason, we always think at our own level. And, and I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind is we always have to allow God to work his way. And we can't just be sitting there like, oh God, I want you to do it this way. I want my parents to buy me a car. I want to win the lottery. I want some amazing, crazy thing to happen so I get a brand new laptop. But when you actually see how God works, it's even though it's so normal, reasonable, and rational, it's so amazing. 
And uh, the more and more I've seen the stupidity of myself and my life and my expectations of God, the more I realize, man, this is, God is, is truly working so amazingly in each and one of our lives. And we have to be those that have to, that kind of gives God room to work the way that he wants in such a higher way than what we're actually thinking ourselves. All right. So like, that's one of the stories I really wanted to share with you guys. Yeah, it's kind of embarrassing. It happened in 2005. So um, I guess the statute of limitations makes it not as embarrassing for me right now, even though it's embarrassing when I say it. It's not as embarrassing because it happened. It happened 19 years ago. That is so crazy. It's been that long. That's how that's that's how old we've gotten. <laughs> that's how old we've gotten. Oh, sorry. That's how old I've gotten. Okay. So uh, that's, I just wanted to share that story with you guys. Hope it's something that you guys will really be able to gain and benefit from too. Um, today, uh, I do have a main topic. I have a main topic and this message I want, because I'm a third generation Christian, I was born in the faith. I was born in the church, baptized as a child. Well, baptized like four or five times my whole life. Um, my whole life as a child, all the way until I was probably 19 years old, was no, 15 years old, was all inside the church. All my friends, my community, everything was there. And I'm not sure if a lot of you guys out there who are born in the faith, like in Korea, uh, we, we call people born in the faith, we call it mote shinang. What that base, shinang means faith, mote is like from the womb. Mote shinang means basically you were born like you were, had faith since the womb, which is a really interesting way to put it, right? But for those of you guys out there who were born in Christianity, born in faith, tell me if you guys went through the exact same thing as me, that when I went, I was so into church and faith. And then when I hit high school, somewhere around my teens, I kind of veered off from faith. And it took me about four years to finally come back to Christ. Have you guys, have you, people born in the faith, have you guys ever been through that? I think it's something that everyone naturally goes through, right? So what I want to talk to you, this is a message I want to give to those who were born in the faith. Whether you're second generation, fifth generation, 10th generation, I want to talk to you why people being born in the faith are important to God's history, okay? So I'm going to give you two big reasons why being born in the faith is so important, okay? Number one is, there is something, being born in the faith, you naturally get something that people who've never had faith have a very, very hard time with. And what is that? It is being born believing in God. From youth, we've heard about God. We, we learn about God. We pray to God. We feel and hear signs from God. We have that altar call. We have that time of receiving the grace and crying and understanding, God, you are truly there in my life. We've gone through it. We believe in God and it's natural. We don't even have a reason to. We just experienced God. And I would say because believing in God is such an innate part of your life, it is just there. It is a blessing. You believe in an almighty, all-powerful creator. That true, that you, you cannot see, you cannot hear or touch, but you believe. Do you know how hard it is, is to take that first step to actually believe in God? It's not an easy thing. You have no issue with this. And that is a blessing that God has given to every person that is born in Christ. And I think when you think about it, even before believing in Jesus, there's first the belief in God. You believe in God first, and <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and after believing in God, we read the Bible. We pray, we learn, and then we hear the gospel, and then we start to believe in Jesus, right? So just to know that there's an invisible creator that is almighty, all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, that cannot be seen or heard, this is the first step in faith that is already done for us. And I would say that this is something that many people will struggle with. And a lot of times as people of like being born in the faith, we kind of take it for granted. We take it for granted that we believe in God and it's not an easy thing just to click on. But just the fact we're born in it and believing in God already, that is something that we should be so grateful and thankful for, right? 
how many times have you heard people say to you, why do you believe in God? Well, well, how, how can you believe in God? Show me God. If you show me God, if you show me God, I'll believe 100%. 100%. How can you be 100% about believing God? And the answer is, we live by faith. We don't have the 100%. It's true, right? We don't have a hundred percent. This is why, you know, oh, I saw God. Oh, God was right next to me. No, we go by faith. And through that faith, we experience God. And those experiences strengthen our faith and strengthen our belief in that almighty, invisible God. Truth, right? We don't have a hundred percent. And the people who don't believe in God, it's hard for them because they're like, well, how can you prove it? And the answer is, we couldn't a hundred percent prove it. It is a personal experience. It's something that we've gone through in our life. Having faith in God is something that people struggle with when they're not born in faith. And we are the ones who believe in God from birth. It's just part of our life, right? How many times, (laughs) excuse me, how many times have people asked you, why do you believe in God? And we're kind of like, oh, well, I just believe, right? It's, the people who didn't believe in God and they went through an experience and they, they were able to feel or experience or see a sign of God, they're the ones that can actually give you an answer, but we were just kind of born into it. We don't have that crazy testimony like other people used to be a drug dealer or a murderer or this or that, and then they had this amazing experience. We don't have that. And sometimes it makes us feel less because we don't have that crazy conversion like Paul had, right? But you have to realize it's a blessing. You know, one thing I find that's very interesting when it comes to the way that the way that we value a testimony is interesting because we put such high value on someone who was the worst of the worst, but then converts to Christ. And we're like, that is the best and greatest testimony ever. And it's true. It's a great testimony. But don't you think that these people would rather have not done any of those bad things? Don't you think? Don't you think a murderer would not? When they come to Christ, they'll realize deep in their hearts, I I, I wish I never murdered someone. It's truth. It's actually far greater for someone to live a righteous life from birth. It's far greater. Someone who's never gone through those, never done those bad things, but just kept their faith in God from the beginning of their life to the very end. That is actually an amazing testimony that I think not many people put value on. We're always looking for the phantasmic testimonies that are so, oh, I used to be the worst. I used to be a bum. I used to be a a drug dealer. I used to be a murderer, a rapist, a prostitute. Like we would think about those things and say, I want to hear that testimony. And I'm not saying that testimony is not, not good. I'm just saying is, I think we don't put enough value on people who have been righteous all their life. Don't you think that's a miracle? I think that's an even greater miracle, not being tempted to that extent, right? So, you know, that's just something I wanted to add in there. But that's the number one thing. First thing is you are born believing in God. And I would say that is a great blessing. Now, the second thing I think is something that we should really think about more deeply and carefully because I know there's a lot of people who are born in the faith and even pastor's kids. And I know many people because they're born in the faith, they kind of take it for granted and they don't read the Bible. Not only do they not read the Bible, they've never read the Bible from front to back. And I am a big advocate that everyone should read the Bible front to back Many times, not just once, just saying that, oh yeah, like 25 years ago, I read the whole Bible from front to back. And I'm like, 25 years ago means you forgot a lot of things. We should be reading the Bible every single day, right? And I'm not going to tell you guys, it's like, go for, just read it every single year from front to back. What I'm going to say is the best way is not so much about how much you read. I would say the best thing is, is do you read consistently every day? I think that is the most important part. But I do also think that as someone who's truly in love with God, you couldn't take Bible reading out. Like, how could you say you love God, but you don't read God's word? That doesn't, really, that doesn't really make any sense, right? And because a lot of people who are born in the faith don't really read the Bible or study the Bible really deeply, one of the things that I would say is, 
One of the important things that we have to understand as people born in the faith is something called a hereditary blessing. Hereditary. It comes from your ancestors, your father, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents. And uh, we need to understand is, if we can't understand this well, we can't understand why it's such a blessing to be born in the faith. Okay? Let's first start off with Exodus chapter 20, verse 5 and 6. Now, verse 5 is going to be like, this is bad, right? Verse 5 says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So we're like going, wow. Sin passes generation to generation up to four generations. So you're like, well, even sin is passed over. But verse six is the one we have to understand is, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. God is someone who blesses and favors those that come from a godly generation. This is why being a second generation, being a third, fourth, fifth generation person of faith is such a blessing because those blessings are passing on when you yourself have done nothing to deserve it. You've done nothing to deserve it. Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 25. Acts chapter 3, verse 25 says, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth would be blessed. This is a promise God gave to Abraham that through his offspring, so it's passing down generation to generation to generation, blessings are being passed on because of what Abraham did. When God says, I am the God of the living, not the dead, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why is Isaac and Jacob being blessed? It's because of their father. It's because of their grandfather. If I take it one step even further, look at 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 12. This is something that's even, for me, that's really interesting, okay? So you guys all know King Solomon. King Solomon had the father, King David, the most famous of all the kings. His heart was only seeking after God. He was so famous. God loved him so much. Solomon began to marry women who brought him their idols, and it caused idol worship inside Israel. So God is like, okay, well, the punishment's coming. Israel's going to be punished. But here's what he says in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 12. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Even when it comes to God's punishment, God says, well, because your father was so great, I will make sure you will not feel that punishment. That's how powerful the generational blessing is from generation to generation to generation. What does that mean? It means that when you are born in the faith, you're not gaining blessings in your life from what you did. You're getting it from the people above you, your ancestors. And what you do is adding on top of that blessing. Haven't you noticed sometimes how some people, you think to yourself, they're just so lucky. They're just so blessed, even though they're not that good. Why? It's because of their ancestors that they're being blessed. This is something we really have to understand. It's because of your ancestors before you. And if you really want to understand this, like, oh, why would God bless us because of my father and my grandfather? Remember, there's, there's uh, something we need to understand. It's from Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. And here is God teaching Moses how to build the tent of tabernacle, and he gives him exact measurements. But the one thing God says to, to Moses is, make sure you do it exactly to how I told you, how to, how to build this tent. Because what you see on earth is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven, right? What is on the earth, the physical realm, is a copy and shadow of what is going on in heaven. Which means if you want to understand spiritual blessings, all you need to do is understand the physical blessings that are handed down from your ancestors. Example, some people are born in a rich household. True, right? Some people are born in a rich household. They're born 
already at this level financially. But some other people are born where? In a poor family. That's all coming from where? Did someone, did that child deserve to be rich? No. Did that child deserve to be poor? No. It is all coming because of their ancestors, right? The children have done nothing to deserve that blessing or curse. It was all brought about because of their ancestors. They did not deserve it. And we need to understand is in the same way, our spiritual blessings come and go dependent upon our ancestors. It's a big thing. And this is why people born in the faith, we are blessed even before we've done anything in our life because of our parents and our grandparents and great-great-grandparents who have done righteousness and it's passing down onto us. And this is why with more blessing comes more responsibility and comes more expectation. Why? Because we start here spiritually. If you really want to know, like when God is God is making his plans. Do you think God makes his plans looking at, oh, they're born now, so let me make a plan for you? Or God, the almighty, all-knowing, omniscient, omnipotent being is looking at things from a very broad perspective of all of time. Remember, God is watching you and God has made plans for you even before you were born, looking at your ancestors and seeing, this is my plan for Pastor Sky. This is my plan for you, my plan for you, my plan for you. Jeremiah chapter one, verse five, what does God say? Before I formed you in the womb, I already knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. You have been planned. You have been set apart for God's purpose even before you were born, generations before. You have been in God's purpose and his plan. And when God is watching us in our lives, he is waiting for us to fulfill his plans. Like, do you really think all people are equal from birth? And the answer is yes and no. We are equal as in we will have our own decisions, our own choices, and our own things that we actually have to do in our life. And we're equal from that point, the things that we do in life. However, our starting points may be different depending on our ancestors. Some people are just blessed because of their ancestors. Think about this. If you're born in a poor family and you, have, you start with debt, you have to work that much harder. First, get out of debt and then create wealth. You're going from debt to no debt. People who are in a family where they're poor, they have a little bit of money, just hundreds of dollars. If you work really hard, you'll make it to thousands and tens of thousands. People who have tens of thousands will build it to hundreds of thousands and maybe millions. And people who are born rich, they start at this level that if they work really hard, if they work with the blessings they have, they will turn their millions into billions. It's, we, we all start in a different position because of our ancestors. We'll all start from scratch when it comes to our own merits, when it comes to us going to heaven, whether we accept Christ or not. But we're completely different in the place that we start from because of our parents and because of our ancestors. In the same way, people born in faith were starting at a different plane. It's just the way it is. Solomon never deserved it. It was because of David. Isaac never deserved it. It was because of Abraham. Jacob never deserved it. It was because of Isaac and Abraham. We're all starting at different points and we are blessed, not because of our own merit, but when we start, we're, we are blessed because of the righteousness of our ancestors. And like I said before, when we're born in the faith, we're starting at a different plane. And God, in his plan, has have been looking at us from generations before. And it kind of reminds me of the story of Job. And in, in the story of Job, Job was someone that God absolutely trusted. He was so great in faith to the point of what? To, the, to what point? Where even when Satan said, let me make him suffer, he only believes in you because you blessed him. And God would say, go ahead. I trust Job. I trust him. And guess what? 
people who are born in the faith, Satan comes. And Satan says, look, they only believe in you because you've blessed them because of their ancestors in this or that. But God in his confidence, God in his confidence in those that are born in the faith says, yeah, go ahead. I trust them. I trust them just like I trust Job. And God is looking at these second generations, third generations, fifth generation, tenth generation Christians. And there is a plan. There is a responsibility. There is something that God has planned so much greater. But a lot of times we fail and we kind of go off on our own. And what I'm going to tell you is this. Have you guys ever heard like the responsibility of the firstborn? Especially back in the days of the Old Testament, the firstborn was the biggest thing, the firstborn male. And what happened was the firstborn male had to take on all the responsibilities of the father. And because of that firstborn right, guess, what, guess where the inheritance goes? Not all of it. So even if you think of the time of um, Jacob, Jacob had, Jacob had 12 sons. The firstborn, what does he get? The firstborn always gets half the fortune, goes to the firstborn. And the remaining 11 brothers will share the last half of the inheritance. That's how big the, the, the right of the firstborn is. It's not about whether you want it or not. It's just you are the firstborn. That is your responsibility. It's kind of like life. You know, a lot of times in life, we kind of go through life saying, oh, I don't want that responsibility. And some things in life are not about whether you want it or not. It's just your responsibility. If you have a baby out of wedlock, you didn't get married, you just had a baby, that, is your, that baby's your responsibility. It doesn't matter if you want it or not. That's your responsibility. It doesn't matter. And when it comes to us, people born in the faith, guess what's going to happen? God is there waiting to bless you even more to make the next generation even better. And what we have to realize as people born in the faith, we have that firstborn right, that responsibility that belongs to us where God says, I trust these people. That's why I'm blessing them because of their ancestors. And we have to take that responsibility, hold accountability for who we are to make God's history be fulfilled. That's the responsibility of people born in the faith. You know, when you think to yourself, it's like, oh, doesn't, doesn't God choose the Gentiles at the time of Jesus? Absolutely. But first it was for the Jews. They were the original chosen ones. God didn't go to Rome. God didn't go to Syria. God didn't go to Babylon. God went to Israel, even though it was a small country. They were the chosen people. And I'll tell you guys this right now, that if the chosen people turned their hearts towards God and believed in Jesus, we would be in a much different position right now. We are chosen. And that's why we are here. And when we become chosen and we have our own family, we are raising the next generation of God that is, should be even stronger than our generation right now. It should be getting stronger and stronger and stronger, not weaker. If the second generation and third generations are weaker in faith, that's a major problem. It means that the history of God will not prosper. Your family will not prosper. It has to become greater at every generation. That's responsibility. And that's accountability of the firstborn. We take care of our father's duties and affairs. And regardless if you feel it or not, that is the responsibility of the firstborn, right? Like I said, when you're rich, right? You're born in a rich family, you turn the millions and you make it billions. That's what you can do from a financial perspective. And from a faith perspective, that's what we're supposed to be doing, becoming more and more righteous from generation to generation, right? The level is different. It's, it's way different. If someone is poor, the, the amount of time it takes for them to go from poor to billions, they may never get there. They may never get there. And this is the responsibility for those that are born in the faith. This is why we need to learn about God even more. You know, 
Like I said before, I talked about pastor's kids. Man, some pastor's kids know nothing. They never read the Bible. They never pray. They never know deeper about God. But this is our responsibility we have to take up. We're not here just as, oh, I am someone here representing myself for my life in this world. We're here to represent God and God's history. And if we take on that responsibility and this history, this is where the history of God becomes greater and, and, and greater, right? If you never read the Bible even once, right? I'm telling you now, you need to learn. You need to learn. I, I told you this verse last week, John chapter 17, verse three. What is salvation? What is eternal life? It is to know God and Jesus Christ, to truly know them. Not just know, truly, deeply know them. And my, I'm, I'm, I, this is a message for those that are born in the faith. We got to do better. We must do better. And this is when you're going to see ama- even more amazing things God is going to do in this world. And this is why more than anyone else, we need to dive that much deeper into the word too. Okay? So, you know, that is a message I wanted to give to all the people born in faith. It is a responsibility. It is something that we need to reach the next level in. And I hope it's something that all of us can really, those of you who are born in the faith will say, okay, what should I do from this point on? Right? What can I do? Sadly, as the Bible says, the first become last and the last become first. Why? Because the first don't do their responsibility and they reach the, they're, they're at the bottom. Where those, like the Gentiles who didn't receive it first, now they become first. But what I'm saying is we have to make it how it truly was meant to be. It's always meant to be the first should be first and the last should be last. That's the way it should be. The first comes, they start work, they have great faith and they keep building their faith and then people keep coming after them and they're all slowly building their faith together. Right? They should all be getting better and better. Right? The first should be first and the last should be last. But there have just been a lot of mistakes and a lot of people not doing their responsibility or holding themselves accountable where we can see a much greater history happening right now. All right? So that is uh, something I just really want to talk to you guys about. I hope it's something that uh, you guys really felt in your hearts. And I hope it's something that uh, we will take on and realize why we were called to be here at this time. Okay? So there it is. I hope you guys really enjoyed this episode of the Rebel Pastor Podcast. I hope you guys have an amazing and awesome week. Uh, We're going to be posting shorts and videos each and every day. So I hope you guys will enjoy those too. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. We'd love to hear them. Uh, Subscribe if you really like this content. And I would say subscribe even if you don't. But you know, that wouldn't be honest, right? But yeah, share it to your friends and I hope to see you guys again. Make sure you click that like button too. Thank you for everyone in the live chat room too. All right, everyone, take care and we'll see you guys again next week on the Rebel Pastor Podcast. And uh, this is Pastor Sky signing out. Bye-bye.